the statistics show 70 to 80 percent of the content on people's websites never gets seen. It's like it's a total waste of time and money. And so I think this is an important idea. How do we learn, how do we create a strategy to get the content to move? That is just as important as creating the content. Welcome to the Schweike Media Expert webinar series where we team up with leading marketing and publishing experts to provide you with tips and best practices to help you grow your business and stay on the cutting edge. Welcome to the show. Hello everyone, I'm here today with Mark Schaefer and Mark is a globally recognized author, speaker, podcaster and business consultant who blogs at Grow, one of the top five marketing blogs of the world. He teaches graduate marketing classes at Rutgers University and has written six best-selling books, including The Tao of Twitter, which is actually the best-selling book on Twitter in the world, and A Content Code, named by INC Magazine as one of the top five marketing books of the year. Mark's latest book is Known, the Handbook for Building and Unleashing Your Personal Brand in the Digital Age. He also wrote the classic first book on influencer marketing called Return on Influence. His many global clients include Pfizer, Cisco, Dell, Adidas, and the U.S. Air Force. He has been a keynote speaker at prestigious events all over the world, including South by Southwest, Marketing Summit Tokyo, and the Institute for International and European Affairs. He has also appeared as a guest on media channels such as CNN, The Wall Street Journal, The New York Times, and CBS News, and now The Magnificent Marketing Podcast. <laughs> and today we are going to talk about what to do in the age of content shock to get the most out of your content marketing efforts. Mark, how are you doing today? Dude, you made me sound pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> was it the last? Was it the last media that you were on, uh, including CNN, The Wall Street Journal, New York Times, and oh, the <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so go ahead and add that to your bio moving forward. I so, will probably do that. <laughs> so how are you doing today? I'm great. I'm uh, I'm home today, which is fun. It's a beautiful summer day, so uh, uh, I'm relaxed and uh, ready to ready to dispense some wisdom today. Well, uh, well, I'm ready to hear it. I, I think well, it'll, be a, you, it'll be a first. What which will be a first? Dispensing wisdom. <laughs> yeah. We're talking about content shock, Mark. If I'm not mistaken, you might have been – I think you were the one who actually coined that term, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct? You are not mistaken, sir. I, yeah. I did. I coined that term in January of 2014, if you can believe that. It's been uh, three and a half years ago. Oh, God. Still, still going strong. Or, or yeah, getting worse, right? Uh, yeah, so uh, you are I, – I, I'm going to – I'm sorry, Mark. I'm going to have to expect that you're going to dispense lots of wisdom for us today. Uh, there's not a person better in the world to talk about this, and I, um, I'm, you know, we're seeing it on this end. So I, I want to dig in here and um, see what you got to say, how you can help us all. But before we get going, just a couple of basics here. I want you to define what content marketing is in your words, and then also go ahead and define what content shock is, um, as well as maybe a couple of examples to point to this being the case in this uh, marketing landscape. Sure. Well, I think you know the great mega trend right now is how do we stand out in an information dense world, and how do we get our message heard in a world that is increasingly moving to an ad free environment? Um, the availability of eyeballs to ads is is going away. Uh, we don't see ads like we used to on television. Uh, you know, I've got I, I watch my television basically on Netflix. I get my radio from uh, satellite channel Sirius XM. I get my newspaper in a subscription. I don't see any ads. I listen to my music, you know, on my iPod. I don't hear any ads. So people may not be seeing our ads anymore like they used to, but they will engage with content. They like stories. They like to be helped and entertained. And so while they may not see our ads, a lot of businesses are now exploring the idea of how do we connect with customers through helpful content. And 
it's become a really, really uh, huge trend, and it, it's worked pretty well. And in the business world, when anything works pretty well, then people start doing more and more and more of it, which makes it more difficult. Mm -hmm. and that's sort of the theme behind content shock. Okay. And it's it's utterly predictable. You know, if you we we're now in the third digital age, the third digital epic, as I like to say. And the first digital epic uh, was just uh, getting on the World Wide Web. If you were the first one with a website, oh, happy day. You had an advantage. Then it got more difficult as your competitors figured it out. Same with SEO. If you were early to the game, you had some advantage. When your competitors figured it out, it got more expensive for those keywords. It got more difficult to be in marketing. And that's where we are today. Social media marketing, content marketing, mobile marketing works really well. And so the web is literally being flooded with content. If you were early in, in the game, you, you know, you might have had an advantage. But now it's much, much more difficult to create content that cuts through the clutter compared to three, four, or five years ago. It's much more difficult to start something new and, and get traction in it. Mm -hmm. Not in all cases, but in a lot of cases. Mm -hmm. And that's the simple idea behind Content Shop. When I wrote the article three and a half years ago, some people thought I was crazy. They thought, this will never happen. We'll never, you know, there will never be, uh, you know, enough content. But we see this happening all around us. Clearly, it's not a theory. There's evidence all around us. There's data all around us that show it's getting more difficult to stand out. It's getting more expensive. Uh, the, you know, basically, we're in an economy for attention, and it's getting more and more costly to earn that attention. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, <clears throat> I mean, is content marketing, in your opinion, still a viable marketing tactic to explore and execute? Well, sure it is, but it doesn't work the same way as it does two or three years ago. And that's what kind of frustrates me is that there are a lot of people out there who are still playing the same old tapes, and the world just doesn't work that way anymore. And that's really what I tried to conquer in my content code book. Um, I am a strategist, and so I looked at this world and I thought, you know, I can't tell my customers, oh, too bad, there's this wall of content coming at us. We're just going to, you know, uh, have to uh, drown with it. I wanted to figure out what do we do. Okay. So I studied this and, uh, you know, tried to, I really kind of obsessed about it. And uh, that, that's, the, that's the theory behind the book Content Code. It's basically the answer to that problem. All right. Well, let's, do you mind if we dig into that? Because if, you know, people hear and, you know, we first experience great results with content marketing and people hear how great content marketing is, but then you see studies and um, that it's not working for me. You know, I'm doing it right. and I don't know what to do and blah, blah, blah. And, and I would, I would guess that a big chunk of those people even venture to say well over half are because they didn't stick with it. Um, and I'd probably say 80% of them is probably because they didn't have an upfront strategy. But I, I would love to hear what your take, you know, so people say, well, uh, I don't want to hear it doesn't work. I know this is great. I don't want to just do interruptive marketing. Help me out. So mm -hmm. what can businesses do? Dig, you know, let's spend some time here and tell us how we can help, you know, help us all succeed in this area. Well, I think the first step that's that's really different than a couple of years ago when all of this was new and content was novel is that we need to step back and we need to assess what is the information density in my marketplace. We need to see how many competitors are out there. What kind of content are they producing? Uh, you know, what type? How often? Where are they promoting it? 
And we need to be strategic, very strategic, about what we choose to do because there is a tremendous cost to producing and promoting content. A lot of people get sucked into this and say, oh, well, you know, Facebook is free and I can start a free blog and hmm. you know, it's kind of intoxicating, but it's not free. There's a cost to uh, the time. There's a cost to just answering comments and questions. There's a time to promoting it on social media that all comes with a cost. So we have to determine what is going to be my content strategy that's going to give me the very best chance to succeed. So that's number one. And then, you know, I get into some specific strategies in the book. There's six uh, to be specific um, about you know, these are the ways that we can get the content to move. So this is the key idea. There is no economic value in content. There is no power or influence or authority or benefit to pushing the publish button. None. The content only has value if it's seen and shared. And because of this increasing information density, that's getting increasingly more difficult to do. So, yes, you've got to have great content. You've got to have a strategy behind it. You need to be building your audience. But then what I suggest in the book is that there needs to be a third competency. You need to figure out how to get the content to move, or as I call it, how do we get it to ignite? How do we get it to spread? The statistics show 70 to 80 percent of the content on people's websites never get seen. It's like it's a total waste of time and money. And so I think this is an important idea. How do we learn, how do we create a strategy to get the content to move? That is just as important as creating the content. Mm -hmm. And it's new, uh, new meaning 12 months new-ish. Uh, before that, I, mean, I don't know, maybe it was even longer ago. I, I lose track of time. But, you know, you never really heard um, you know, at the content marketing conferences, people talking about distribution. Um, it, it was just not a point of emphasis. And in the last, like I said, 12 to maybe 18 months or so, uh, you've been hearing a lot more talk about you got to distribute. And I was like, that's what I've been asking <laughs> this whole time. I was like, how are you? I mean, are y'all really, you know, getting this to spread unless you're, you know, I already have a huge following just by putting it up? I was like, I don't, I'm not seeing that happen, you know? So I, um, I'm, you know, it's comforting to hear other people say that. So let's talk about that. What, how, what are some successes that you've seen to get that ball, you know, that boulder rolling down that hill? Well, I think the successes come from finding uh, some sort of angle that is really different, that gets uh, attention. Um, so, for example, uh, and, and really, the, 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 idea, the ideas in the content code kind of spread over into my new book, Known, too. It's about how to ignite your personal brand. So it's almost like content marketing on an individual basis. And there's a lot of great stories in the book. And one of my favorite, uh, I'm sure you know or at least have heard of, uh, a well-known podcaster named John Lee Dumas. And John Lee had started this thing called Entrepreneur on Fire. And the reason he started it was he was basically kind of a down-on-your-luck real estate agent in California. He wasn't doing very well because it was right at the beginning of the recession, the world financial crisis. And he was spending a lot of time driving around California dreaming about how to start a business. And one of his friends said, you got to listen to podcasts to learn how to start a business. He said, what's a podcast? Well, he got hooked, and he was spending so much time in his car that he got frustrated because he was going through the entire range of episodes for a show. There was no podcast that was every day. So he said, that is a niche for me. I'm going to take people with me on my journey to learn about how to be an entrepreneur, and I'm going to do it every day. And 
so he found his angle. He found his niche. Look, the amount of content being created about how to be entrepreneur, how to be an entrepreneur, it's mind boggling. Mm -hmm. John now has a multi million dollar business because he found some uncontested niche, an uncontested little segment that he could own and dominate. When you get right down to it, the goal is to create content shock for your competitors, to find some angle, some niche that you can own and create so much excellent, helpful content that it's going to uh, really, competitors will look at that and they'll say, well, we can't do that. This person already owns it. Uh-huh. Now, what, what about, you know, getting the word out, like you mentioned? Um, like, are, are you into paid methods for content distribution? And if, if so, how, how can one be strategically sound with their strategy and then execution there? Well, there are there are lots of of paid uh, methods, but uh, again, you need to be mindful about that. You need to mm -hmm. also look at um, what are our competitors doing? How are they promoting content? How how can I uh, maneuver? Um, you know, one of the go-to places has been Facebook ads. Uh, for a lot of people, that still is a wonderful opportunity. But a couple months ago, Facebook announced that their 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 ad inventory is drying up. Why? Because people aren't you know people aren't uh, getting their content shared, so they're advertising on Facebook. Now the adverti the advertising inventory is is declining. What's that going to mean? Prices of ads are going to go up on Facebook. And, and so there could could be opportunities other places. You know, uh, you it, it, there's no cookie cutter answer. There's nothing mm -hmm. that works for everybody. But you, you know, there might be an opportunity on Twitter. There might be opportunities on LinkedIn. There might be opportunities in native advertising or sponsored content, uh, which is a very hot area right now. So I think you know the the big idea is whatever you choose to do. Take the time to do a little research first. Take the time to do a little planning. Don't just use Facebook advertising or Google AdWords as a default. Think it through. Figure out what you need to do to be successful with your particular business in your particular vertical. Now, do you have any um, direction or advice on, you know, you said take the time, do your research. Um, I, you know, I'm sure there's going to be people listening. They're like, okay, that sounds great. Um, geez, where do I start, right? So, do you have any advice on um, how to do proper research on your competitors? Well, I'll, t <laughs> I'll tell you, it's almost embarrassing to say this, <laughs> but uh, most I find that most companies really don't study their competitors. And it's almost like a little secret of mine. <laughs> when I do consulting, one of the first thing I'll, th things I'll do is a competitive analysis. Now, anybody in that company can do that, but I'll lay things out on a spreadsheet and I'll say, well, th this is the type of content your competitor is creating. These are the places where they're promoting it. These are the audiences they're reaching. Here's their estimated reach in these areas. And when you lay all that out, you start to see some open places. Well, how did you find all that information? Is there certain tools that you use, or you just go to their website? You just look at their website. <laughs> okay. So yeah, I mean, no, but for real though, I mean, that, I mean, that's you know, that's what I'm looking to, you know. Yeah, so I mean, that, that's the answer, that's the answer. So for example, I, work, I worked on a project for, for Adidas, and they were introducing a new product into the marketplace, and they were going to compete, be competing with North Face and Columbia and Patagonia. So they wanted a, a social media strategy and a content strategy. So I, I with the help of a, of a friend who helped me with the research, we, we, did, we, we did a deep dive, 
and we just looked. Okay, Patagonia. Do they have a blog? Are they making videos? Are they on Snapchat? Are they on Pinterest? Are they on Instagram? If so, are, how active are they? What's the tone of the content? Uh, how many followers do they have? Uh, what sort of reach are they getting? Uh, and then you start, you know, you could use some other tools uh, to kind of look at what's, what's their influence in these different areas. And then you just kind of lay it out on a spreadsheet and then you start to see, hmm, well, this area is completely saturated. That, you know, every, every single one of them has a blog. Uh, I'm, if, if I'm going to create a blog, it's going to have to be something different. What could that be? Or maybe I need to promote it in a different way. What would, what would I do? And so really that's, that's the first thing. And then you can also do some research. There's a lot of just free available information out there um, about um, you know, success stories, either in your industry or related industries, to kind of give you some ideas of some best practices, uh, where your customers might be. You might just do some research and talk to your customers. How are they getting their information today? If you think you know where they're getting their information, uh, you know, things have changed a lot in the last year and a half. Might be time to ask them again. So these are just basic marketing tools but what I find, and like I said, it's almost embarrassing to say, most people don't even start with the basics. They just, you know, they just jump right in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, no. I mean, I hear what you're saying, and you're echoing what, um, shoot, what, you know, Ann Handley just, you know, talked about a little bit. You know, definitely slowing down. Like, slow down. <laughs> Everybody slow down. Stop just yeah. Running it after every new shiny object, start running with a marketing plan. You know, slow down mm -hmm. and, and spend the majority of your time just analyzing before you put anything together. Um, so I, I, I've been hearing this more and more lately, and I think it's not because people hear other people say it. I think it's because it is what it is. You know, the we're in this content shock, so now the winners are going to be the people who think things through better rather than waste their money for four to six months and they give up because they exactly they think right. it's not working although it might be working they might not know it's working because they didn't think they didn't think through what they're gonna be looking for like you know growing their email list which kind of you know kind of segues into something else i wanted to talk about here which is you know growing email lists you know i believe that i saw something on content marketing world uh within the last month that said stop uh looking at conversions for like uh uh, you know, for sales team leads, uh, but start concentrating on growing your email list. Like that's your number one metric that you need to be looking at. Now you can disagree or agree if it's the number one thing, but I think we're going to agree that it's important. So um, tell me in your experiences, uh, how have you seen some of the best methods of doing that? Assuming you, you do agree that growing your email list is important, but what, ha what, what are some of your success stories where you're like, man, this doing something like this so that really helped out that, you know, growing that list. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, first of all, let's, let's back up and let me validate that I do think uh, emails, email lists are very important. When I teach my uh, graduate classes, I describe email as really the glue that holds social media and content marketing together. And one of the goals hmm. is to is to well, let's put it this way: when a lot of people start out with uh, content marketing or social media, they're creating this content, and they may feel like they're just sending a message in a bottle out in the ocean. They don't know if anybody's looking at it. They don't know if anybody's seeing it or responding to it, and it can be really frustrating. So if you do it well and you do it consistently over time, then you, you, the next goal, the, the phase that you should be looking for is reliable reach, which means subscriptions. People are opting in to your blog, your video, your podcast, your, uh, your newsletter, your Pinterest page, your Instagram account, whatever it is. And so now, in a virtual way, people are saying, 
you're special to me. It's okay to market to me because you're different. Now, a lot of people put the focus on Facebook. That's the first place they start, maybe the only place they go. And let me tell you something. In terms of attaining that reliable reach, it's at the bottom. I think it's more difficult to market through Facebook than almost any other channel. And here's what I put as number one, email, because people still open email. Now, of course, there's different open rates, different success depending on different industries and different demographics and so forth. But if you do, you know, pretty decent um, with an email list, you might get 20% of your customers opening it. If you post something on Facebook, what's it going to take to get 20% of your followers to see something on Facebook? You're going to have to create something either exceptional or you're going to have to pay a lot of money to get it uh, promoted. Mm -hmm. So email, I still think, is a, um, a, a very, very good uh, way to connect with customers. It, it's one of the few ways left. To Isn't it funny that that's that that stood the test of time? It is. And, Isn't you know, it? Like of all the things, overlook it. And yeah, no, they totally do. You, 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 so I agree that that concentrating on that is is very important because the content is migrating toward Facebook, toward news feeds, and when that happens, you lose that direct relationship with your customer. That's why email continues to be so important. Okay, um, so uh, in your experience with companies you've worked with or yourself, um, what are what have been some of your most um, successful ways to capture, you know, opt-in emails? Well, I take a, a little bit of a contrary view on this. The most popular way that a lot of people use will be pop-up ads on their sites. And they work. Research shows that they work. I don't do that. And one of my philosophies is that we should be treating people online the same as we treat people offline. And so like five or six years ago, when everybody was doing all these black hat SEO tricks and links and backlinks and all this stuff, I never did any of that stuff. I knew it couldn't work. I knew Google wouldn't allow that to work. We also see Google starting to penalize some of these sites that are doing pop-up ads. I think that started, I want to say in January, uh, Google started initiating this penalty. So my view and, and, and what I try to encourage my customers to do is to not be annoying, to not put up blocks to the content that demand that you subscribe uh, before you get access to, you know, whatever. What, what my strategy would be is to, again, it goes back to er the early part of the conversation. Don't create any block that would keep that content from spreading, from igniting. Let people have access to the content without signing up for something. Um, treat them like you would want to treat yourself. People have told me, I really appreciate you don't have, you don't have pop-ups on your site. Concentrate on being helpful. Concentrate on adding value. And it's perfectly fine to add a call to action at the end of your content, at the end of your podcast, at the end of your video. Hey, if you love this, think about clicking on this link and subscribing. I'd love for you to be part of my community where you'll be getting, you know, this bonus information. Give them some incentive to uh, to um, to subscribe. So all these tricks that people have used, you know, I've, I sort of predicted that they'll go out of fashion eventually. And I think we're starting to see the beginning of that with this Google announcement in January. Okay. So you're, you're basically, you know, just be super helpful, be super engaging, and, and it organically happens for you. Well, I think it's, that, it's, 
It's just as simple. You need to be relevant and superior. If you're relevant and superior, you can become part of a habit and people will subscribe. The moment you lose your edge, the moment that something else uh, is, is more relevant and more superior, people are going to leave and it's going to be hard to get them back. So you need to concentrate on whatever you find to be your, your niche, your angle. Work it. Don't give up. Concentrate on it for at least a year. One of the things I, I, I've written about in my new book is don't, don't only be obsessed with financial measures and, and quantitative measures like leads or even subscriptions. Look at qualitative measures that are signs that you're on track. Are you invited to do a guest post? Are people leaving more comments on your on your content? Are you invited to do a you know be part of a roundup post or to be a guest on a podcast? These are all signs that your personal brand is building or your company brand is building, and that it's beginning to ignite. So don't ignore those things uh, because you mentioned it earlier. One of the big problems is that people give up too soon. It kind of doesn't happen, doesn't happen, and then all of a sudden it does. It took two years for me to get traction on on my blog. Uh, you know, today I get more traffic in one week than I got in my whole first two years combined. Uh, for the people that I interviewed in my in my new book, uh, it took them about two and a half years on average for the content marketing initiative to really click in and to hmm. really start bringing the benefits home. So you know, pay attention to little signs from the universe that, that things are moving along. Okay. Appreciate that. All right. Hey, I want to circle back uh, to what we were talking about earlier and, you know, about the upfront planning. And I think you were even were talking about a specific company you were working with where you, you know, you laid out on the spreadsheet and you, and uh, you showed them what their competitors were doing and the competitor analysis. I, I, I personally, and I don't think I'm the only one like this, but, uh, you know, I'm a bit of a visual learner in the sense that, you know, examples, you know, real life, real things, uh, hearing them, even they're, they're not about my same company or industry, helps me apply those and connect the dots. So, could you talk about or you know share a story with us where you did this analysis? And you can leave company names out or anything specific, but uh, where you did this, the opportunity that you um, discovered, and then what you executed because of what you uh, had uh, discovered through your analysis. Is that possible? Well, I mean, I, I, I already talked about the, the Adidas example and how it played out was we discovered that the competitors, the audience of the competitors was aging. So, for example, the average Patagonia customer was 50. Um, most people were buying um, – uh, from uh, North Face because they want to look like an adventurer. They're not really an adventurer, they, but they want the raincoat and the backpack because, you know, they want to look like an adventurer. So the, so the young people who really are the adventurers, they were being left behind. So in this case, our content strategy wasn't built on uh, necessarily – you know, a blog or a video or whatever, we didn't start there. What we started with was a demographic, is to say, how do we connect with uh, this youth movement? And uh, because so many young people play soccer today, they know Adidas. It's a very popular brand from their soccer days. And so transferring them into trail running or rock climbing or some of these outdoor sports seemed like a natural. Now, one of the things that's very important today, and, and this kind of hits on a lot of cylinders that we talked about in terms of 
promotion, ignition, uh, leveraging your content, getting it to be heard is the role of influencers. Uh, today, some companies, they don't have time to build that audience, to build that email list, to build that emotional connection and wait that two and a half years to get traction. They need to do it now. So one of the very legitimate strategies and an increasingly important strategy is to work with influencers. Identify influencers in your space that can help you ignite your ideas and ignite your content. And that was one of the key strategies we work with with Adidas is to identify who are some of these young people who are the heroes of trail running, of rock climbing. Who are some of the heroes working in the retail stores? Who are some of the heroes that are coaches, that are training people at the high school level, at the junior high level? And how do we get them to become fans of our brand and our our content? And uh, so that was a very key part of the strategy. But it all came back to this competitive analysis. It all came back yeah. to figuring out, look, these competitors have, in some cases, a three-year head start over us. We can't go head-to-head -to -head to head -to -head with them. It would be just a waste of money. We've got to find a new way to maneuver based on the research, based on data. And that's what they did, and uh, it's been highly successful. Then you got to the fun stuff. So, yeah, just eat your vegetables, and then you, you can have the desserts, you know? Because yeah. then after that, all the fun stuff happened. So how, how did you uh, get those, uh, you know, and when you say influencers, why don't you define if you're talking about Jay-Z or if you're talking about, you know, medium uh, level or, you know, medium large micro type of influencers? Uh, why don't you speak on that? Because I think there's some confusion on influencer marketing when it comes to that, that people don't understand. These aren't necessarily going to be people that you know. You know, they, right. We're not talking about movie stars necessarily. So why don't you touch on that to uh, clear that well, up? There are three different kinds of influencers. One is the celebrity, like Kim Kardashian. And uh, that's, that's been used for you know, a century or more. If you want to align the values of your brand, with the values of some celebrity, that still works if you've got lots of money in the bank. Now, the second type of celebrity is, or excuse me, influencer, is the type of person who builds their influence through their content. That, an example of that would be me. Uh, Ten years ago, before I started my blog, nobody knew who I was. Nobody heard of me before. But through my blog, that led to books, and the books led to speeches, and now I, I, I work and teach and consult uh, all over the world, 100% built on the reputation that came through my content. So today, that could be a Snapchat star, it could be a YouTube star, or it could be simply somebody in your industry that uh, does reviews on their blog of things going up in your business. And there are lots of tools to uh, find those uh, influencers. Uh, I mean, a, a Tracker would be one, but there are lots of others out there. They vary in price. They vary in capabilities. Uh, Cision is another one. Cision kind of focuses more on media kind of influencers. The third type of influencer is an advocate. Now, an advocate is someone who just loves you. They love what you do. They love your product. They love your blog or whatever it is. And you don't have to pay them. You don't have to convince them. You don't have to cajole them. They just want more. <laughs> mm -hmm. So an example of that would be uh, these uh, young people, for example, today, They'll go on a shopping spree, and they'll come back to their bedroom, and they'll open up their bags, and they'll try on their clothes. And they're making hundreds of thousands of dollars from sponsors now because people love to see these videos, and they respect uh, the style and the advice um, of these young people. 
And so that would be the example of, of, a, of an advocate. So for most businesses today, you know, you, you probably don't have the budget for a celebrity. You should always be looking out for the advocates because they're going to move the needle. These are people who genuinely, authentically love you, and they're telling all their friends about you. And then the influencer is the one that can really have a lot of SWAT. It can, if you've got something going on with your business, uh, they're the ones that can, you know, make something help you go viral. Um, and but you need to treat those people as if you know you need to get into a relationship with them. Uh, you need to treat them almost like you would treat an analyst or a reporter. You know, you're not going to just show up and buy them off. You need to develop a relationship with them over time, which is something that people uh, kind of overlook. Mm -hmm. So what did you all do with the Adidas to um, win them over? I mean, obviously you're going to, you know, be purchasing their time and their influence and all that, but, you know, I'm sure that there was – something thought through, especially seeing everything that you've said, you know, with all the upfront planning and everything. How, how did you uh, really ignite, you know, their true passion? Well, we went a couple of different routes. The, the first thing is we identified who are some of the superstar athletes. Now, even their, you know, uh, someone who's a superstar athlete and they're a rock climber, that's not like signing a contract with uh, – you know, Kobe Bryant or, you know, uh, you know, Tom Brady or something like that. So these are still young people who are broke. They're the best in their field and everybody loves them, but they're still trying to figure out how to get to the, the mountain face that they've always wanted to climb. So supplying them with gear, supplying them with training, supplying them with a little money here and there to get them to their next adventure, teaching them how to create content, teaching them how to ignite the content, um, had a had a big, big uh, payoff. Um, what we were able to do is kind of measure their effectiveness at the beginning, measure their effectiveness at the end after they did the training to show how we're able to um, increase how much the content was was moving, which of course um, is the goal. We also used some social listening tools to try to find advocates, to try to find people who are out there who are just you know posting about our products and loving our loving oh, the products. So smart. And you, just got, you just got like probably millions of dollars in free advertising by simply implementing that strategy. All the, and, and a lot of these folks, they just want to be acknowledged. Mm -hmm. you know. And if you love Adidas and you hear from somebody from Adidas, that's the, yeah. best, day, that's the best day of the whole month. <laughs> it really is, though. Just think about it. Everybody think about it. Every time you get replied to by a company, yeah. even if it's a company that you don't like, love, you're like, that was cool. <laughs> you know? I mean, it's, it's, it's not this amazing piece of research. I feel it every time. That said um, – that uh, the the millennial generation. This is I mean I, I hate pigeonholing people, but I mean there are certain generational um, trends. And uh, I saw this amazing statistic that showed that something like 35% of the millennials want to be recognized and acknowledged by their peers. 54% want to be recognized and acknowledged by a brand. What? Yes. That, I mean, is everything I just said kind of contradicts what I, my, my initial reaction to all this, but I, I, I'm i shocked to hear that. I, 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 it, 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 I think it confirms what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess it does, but I'm still shocked to hear that statistic. That's, that that's shocks me too that, it, it, you know, what they're saying, and this was done – you know, I, 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 I can't remember off the top of my head, but I only quote and write about reputable research. So it came from, you know, Pew or it came from, you know, Edison or someplace like that. Um, but what it, it blew my mind when I read this because it shows that people aspire to be acknowledged by a company even more than their friends. That's insane. 
it's I guess they're so used to it, I guess, on Facebook, right? Everyone liking everybody's stuff for no reason. Yeah. <laughs> if, a brand, if a brand likes you, that's, yeah. that's the coolest thing that can happen. I'll tell you right now, me personally, you know, I post um, aggregate content, you know, stuff that I read and I feel I don't post everything that I read or just what I read and I think it's going to add value to somebody else. I put it in my social rotation and I share it out. I think I probably share a lot of your stuff out too and, uh, and I'll tag those companies. And then when they say thank you, you know, simply thanks for sharing, you think I'm going to do it more? Absolutely. You know, I mean, I, I think it's the easiest thing. Paying you? No. Yeah, and then, you know, and I'll turn from, yeah. And it's more valuable. Exactly. All it takes is a little recognition, and you're on fire. And it takes no time, as long as you're, you've are you set up your listening tools. Or you don't even need to set up that listening tool, you know, but just to actually – and I'll tell you, other companies haven't. And there have been times that on the flip side of this now, um, there have been people that I've been tagging and doing stuff for, like, years. Um, and, and I mean, literally, I'll go, like, multiple years of doing something, and then – I'm going through my list, and I've added other people that I'm doing this for, and I'm like, you know, I'm not doing it anymore for them. They, not one time have they just said thank you or even pushed the like button, you know? I'm, so I'm kind, of, I'm kind of running a social experiment. I'm a, I'm a big I, – I love Home Depot. I go to Home I, – I spend more money on Home Depot than almost any other store, which explains why my wardrobe is so bad. <laughs> <laughs> but – so I'll take pictures – of me at Home Depot, and I'm, I'll, I'll write, I'll mention them in uh, on Twitter. I'll mention them on Facebook with a hashtag. And I'm just waiting for the day <laughs> I'm going to get an acknowledgement. That's never happened because Home Depot and Lowe's both they're just so so far behind. Uh, they're just so in the dark on this stuff, and they've got these amazing opportunities to connect with, with advocates like me. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's ridiculous because they have great content. Home Depot has well, great content. amazing content. Yeah. If they, if they go and take the next step, I think they, uh, they need to hire you, Mark. Jeez, Louise. Hire me. <laughs> How can I hire Mark? Home Depot. For real. Yeah. Like for real. Yeah. Like you could ignite because they're, yeah, they're a sleeping giant when it comes to the social world, it sounds like. But, I mean, let's say that they continue not to tag you. Are you going to give it a go at Lowe's and see if they do and switch allegiances? <laughs> you never know. Well, I'm not at that point yet. It's, it's, it's kind of it's, it's kind of like just, you know, I'm in, I've been into it so many years now. I just someday, because <laughs> it's going to make a great blog post, you know, <laughs> my 22nd year of tweeting about Home Depot, and they finally said, Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. Well, uh, I, man, this has been fun, Mark. Very, very educational. Um, before, well, r real quick, before I ask about like a big prediction from you, um, do you see this getting worse, this content shock, or do you see people kind of you know, enough people giving up where the leaders are going to take it and it's going to level off, or do you just see it just continuing to get harder and more crowded? Well, this, the, the great irony of our business, uh, I think you mentioned early on in the in the podcast episode something about how um, you know, more and more budgets, more and more people are creating content, more and more budgets are going toward creating content. The amount of content is literally exploding out there. And this is the statistic that kind of uh, just surprises me, that 80% of the companies respond that – they can't – they're not satisfied with how they're measuring content marketing. So 80% of the companies don't really know if they're getting a benefit or not. Now, another, in the same study, 80% of the companies in the study said they're increasing their content marketing budget. So most okay. companies – don't know if it's working, but most companies are increasing their budget. Why is that? Because they're afraid not to. Yeah. And, and it really does have its other benefits too. Well, it has it has benefits. It has but, SEO but, benefits and all. They, of it. You know, they're willing to they're willing to be patient, and they really don't know where it's heading, and they know that this is a big trend, and they're they're afraid to not 
be on the boat. So the, the fact of the matter is it is getting worse. Uh, you know, all the statistics show that it's getting worse. The amount of content, the amount of, you know, news articles is going up, up, up. Uh, so definitely uh, the situation is, is getting worse and, and will for the foreseeable future. All right, so paying even more attention to what you said. But on that note, what's left to do? You know, I mean, how other way can you market yourself without take out the top 100 companies who have a budget to be able to put a swoosh logo up and it means something, right? Um, I mean, you know, with their interruptive advertising. I mean, it's you know, it's, I mean, yeah, you obviously have your direct mail and radio and TV and all those will have its place, um, you know, and you have your search engine marketing and you do have other things, but as a whole for an, a complete marketing strategy, it has to be around content, uh, even if it's not the written word, but it needs to be some, an experience, it needs to be something. So maybe that's part of the reason too, because it's, you know, I mean, with everything you mentioned earlier, how you, you know, yeah, you, you listen to your music, you watch the TV, and all of us. I mean, I can't remember the last time I watched a commercial if I'm not watching CNN, you know. Uh, so, yeah, I, uh, I think you need to be strategic. You need to really pay attention to what are your opportunities. Uh, you don't want to go, you know, headlong and be spending money in a niche that's already saturated. You need to figure out how you can maneuver. maneuver. And then, you know, my book, The Content Code, goes through six different strategies that you can use to get your content to move to ignite your content. So that's really, I mean, I think it's like a $16 book or something like that. You can get 14 years of, 14 months of work. <laughs> from me. So for what's that? A dollar twenty cents a year for per six, month. Per month. For sixteen for sixteen dollars. It's a it's a heck it's a heck of a value. Well you sold me. I'll uh, uh, I'll shoot an email her. to my wife to she handles our Amazon purchasing. Uh, uh, I'll tell her to buy it for me right okay. now. So you got one book sale out of this. <laughs> All right, there you go. <laughs> All right, what, what give me one big prediction for you uh marketing just in general in the future. Well, there's something going on that's, that's quite interesting that a, a lot of marketers aren't really talking about, and that's the migration from public social media to private media channels like Messenger, Snapchat, and WhatsApp. And at the end of 2015, for the first time, there were more people using these private messaging services than the public services. That has a profound impact on marketing, but yet you hardly see anything about it. Uh, people are still obsessed with, you know, how to get more people to, you know, like my Facebook post or, you know, Facebook advertising or, you know, how to be a YouTube star or whatever. But more and more of the communication, the conversations, and the, the, the activity is happening behind these privacy walls where we can't see it, we can't monitor it, <clears throat> um, and um, so it's going to be interesting to see what happens in the next few years. Marketing's going to change a lot. Well, that's that's one of the one constants in life, <laughs> right? Death, taxes, and marketing is going to change. Um, so, uh, how can people continue to learn from you? Very easy. You can find everything about me at businessesgrow.com. Uh, my blog is there, my podcast is there, my books, and lots of other free resources to help businesses of just about any size. Gotcha. And your Twitter handle, let me just spell it out. It's M-A-R-K-W-S-C-H-A-E-F-E-R. -E -E right. All right, Mark. Well, until next time, and uh, I, I really appreciate your time. This is a lot of fun and very informative. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.